All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Nakia Ellis, and I am with the Domestic Violence Crisis Center. And today we're going to be talking about identifying different types of domestic violence. So before we begin, just want to talk a little bit about DVCC. Um, we offer free and confidential services for victims of domestic violence, teen dating abuse, and intimate partner violence. Um, that includes free individual and group counseling for both children and adults, um, a number of adv advocacy programs, including free legal assistance, um, assistance with financial and housing needs, um, as well as two emergency safe houses located within the community. So if anyone for any reason no longer felt safe at home, um, they could stay at one of our emergency shelters. Um, most importantly, we have a 24 seven crisis hotline um, that uh, anyone can call or text and that's that 888 number at the bottom. So it's 888-774-2900. Um, as well as youth prevention education programs and professional trainings, which um, this is one of a part of one of the series for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So thank you any, for everyone um, who's able to view this video this evening. So before we begin, I do just want to be mindful that some of the stuff that we will cover today uh, could potentially be um, overwhelming for some folks, especially if they have experienced trauma in the past. Um, so please just be mindful of that and take care of yourself. We want to make sure that everyone is feeling safe as we engage with this material. So let's start off with our why. Why are we doing this? Why are we here? Um, so statistically, we know that one in four women and one in seven men in the U.S. will experience physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Um, so that is a significant number, and it's important that we talk about it and know the different types of abuse and recognize those red flags um, and have the tools so we can help ourselves and our loved ones. We also know that domestic violence is the leading cause of homelessness for women and children. And we know that growing up in a home where domestic violence is present is the strongest predictor of a child becoming either a perpetrator or a victim of domestic violence later in life. So that is our why. That's why we are here today. Um, a great way to kind of start the conversation when we're talking about the different types of abuse as well as, you know, unhealthy red flags is to take a look at the relationship spectrum. Um, so all relationships fall on a spectrum from healthy to unhealthy to abusive. Um, it's important to recognize that abuse doesn't just happen overnight. Um, there's typically going to be a series of unhealthy uh, behaviors, unhealthy red flags um, that ultimately culminate into uh, that incident of abuse. So we are here to learn about the red flags early on so that we can prevent it from getting to that extreme side of abuse. Um, so we're going to go over really briefly what uh, healthy green flags look like in a relationship, um, as well as review uh, of what unhealthy red flags that we want to be on the lookout for. And then we're going to wrap up um, by talking about the different types of abuse. So just keep in mind when we're talking about relationships, we're just going to keep sliding back and forth on this relationship spectrum. Okay, so starting off with green flags. Um, these are healthy, good things that we want for all of our relationships, not just romantic dating relationships, but um, also relationships with our family members, with our friends, with our coworkers. Um, so when we're talking about these good things, we're gonna be looking going to be looking out for um, healthy communication. Do we feel comfortable sharing our thoughts, our opinions, our ideas with the other person? Um, is there trust and honesty? Do we feel like we can be open and honest and we can trust that that person is not going to, you know, betray us and, and tell our personal information to other people? Um, or can we trust that they're not going to do anything to jeopardize um, the health of the relationship? 
We're also looking for equality, um, that both people have an equal say, that um, both people are able to uh, voice their opinions, voice their wants, their needs for the relationship, and feel like they're being heard. Um, it also looks like equal input, that both people are showing up and giving their, uh, giving their all for that relationship. And it's not going to be this one-sided thing where one person is constantly taking um, and the other person is, is constantly giving, right? Because that's going to be very one-sided and not sustainable. We also um, want to see that there's going to be a lot of healthy independence where, you know, they can definitely depend on them and spend time together, uh, but it's not going to be every moment of the day, right? That they can still have their own things, their own friends, their own hobbies and interests, um, and not feel like they have to give up parts of who they are in order to be in the relationship. Another green flag that we want to be on the lookout for are boundaries. Um, boundaries are basically personal lines or limits that we set with other people um, to let them know what we're comfortable with um, and what we're uncomfortable with. And we put these lines and limits in place so that we feel safe around them. So we can have boundaries around our emotions. We can have boundaries around um, our personal uh, you know, possessions. We can have boundaries around our physical space. Um, and all it takes is a conversation to set those boundaries. So, you know, maybe I have a boundary around my cell phone that I don't want anyone to go through my cell phone unless they have permission, or I don't want anyone to use my cell phone unless they have permission um, to do so. So they would have to ask me first, they would have to get that permission or that consent um, in order to use my phone, right? So that's the boundary that I would set with people in my life. So um, these are just going to be some examples of green flags that we want to look out for. And it's important that we uh, know these green flags. And this is not a full list, but just a kind of good idea. Um, because when we're talking about red flags, there's going to be an absence of these green flags. Um, so when we're talking about um, someone that is, you know, acting really jealous, that's probably means that there's going to be a lack of trust in the relationship, right? Or maybe there's going to be a lack of respect. Um, so we want to compare and contrast these green flags and the red flags that you're going to see on the next slide. So now we have red flags. So these are going to be the unhealthy behaviors in the relationship that we want to be on the lookout for. Um, and again, it does not just apply to uh, dating relationships. This can be in friendships or familial relationships as well. Um, so things such as, like I just mentioned, jealousy. Um, are they being really possessive? Are um, they demanding more and more of your time? Um, are they, you know, getting upset if uh, a person spends, you know, their partner spends time with another person or they want time to themselves, uh, right? That would be showing a lack of trust as well as not respecting um, their independence and perhaps not respecting their boundaries. Um, we also know that if someone is being really controlling, right, that that's going to be a huge red flag. And that actually um, is an indicator that the relationship could potentially be abusive. And we'll talk more about power and control in just a little bit. Um, additionally, we know that if uh, a partner is feeling isolated, meaning that they're cut off from their friends, their families, their other forms of social support, that's going to be a really big red flag as well. So maybe if you notice that a friend has kind of pulled away now that they're in a relationship and they aren't able to hang out anymore, um, or, you know, they are making a lot of excuses or canceling on you a lot, that could be a sign um, that the relationship is potentially unhealthy. Now, um, isolation sometimes happens by force, or it could happen by manipulation, or it could, you know, happen consensually, but no matter how it comes about, it could still potentially be unhealthy, because if that person that's in that unhealthy relationship feels like they have no one else that they can reach out to, that they can talk to, that they can um, go to for support, um, then that could entrap them and keep that keep them in that relationship for even longer. So we want to be on the lookout for isolation as well. Um, additionally, if a person feels like they have to walk on eggshells, um, they're afraid of what their partner might say or do, so they're very, very careful of how they speak and, and you know what they do around their partner because they don't want to set them off, that's also going to be a big red flag. 
um, as well as um, minimizing or dismissing uh, anytime that there's a problem um, or making excuses, like never taking responsibility, deflecting that responsibility, that also could be a sign that the relationship is unhealthy, right? Because there's no way that they can fix a potential problem if they're not even acknowledging um, that there is a problem or that they did anything wrong. So these are some examples of some red flags. And now I'm going to uh, share with you what some of these red flags might sound like. So um, if you maybe hear a friend or a loved one say something to the effect of, you know, they don't like my friends or family, right? That could be a sign that they're being isolated. Um, or, you know, she's just jealous and cares a lot, right? That jealousy red flag that we just talked about. Um, he's always checking in on me. That could show a lack of trust as well as not respecting someone's independence and maybe that they're also being really clingy. Um, you know, gets mad at me when the baby cries. That could be a sign of fear that they have to walk on eggshells and um, they're very, very careful um, to not um, have their partner hear the baby because they know it's going to start an argument or a fight. Right. So if you're hearing any of these um, phrases when you're having a conversation with a friend or loved one, right, that should kind of uh, pique your interest a little bit. And it's just a good way to pay more attention, maybe ask some more questions, just let them know that you're here to talk um, if they want to, um, to discuss it further. So those are some examples of what red flags sound like. So now that we went through the healthy green flags, so we went through the healthy side of the relationship spectrum, we covered the unhealthy red flags, so that middle area of that relationship spectrum. Now let's talk about what abuse looks like. So let's start off by defining um, domestic violence or intimate partner violence. So that's going to be the intentional use of a pattern of destructive behaviors um, by one person to exert power and control over their dating partner. Um, so if you notice, I highlighted the, the, the two terms, power and control, right? That's going to be the key to any um, abusive relationship is one person trying to exert um, that power and control over another. So now let's go into the different types of abuse, the different ways that um, an abusive partner may try to maintain that control um, over the other person. So what we most probably think of first and foremost is physical abuse. That's probably the one that we um, think about most often when we hear the term domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Um, and that's any use of physical force with the intent to control a partner through fear or injury. Um, now, it's important to recognize that physical abuse does not always leave a mark or a bruise. It's not all, always necessarily physical contact. Um, for instance, if, you know, during an argument, um, a partner starts being really destructive, uh, throwing plates or glasses, um, punching holes in the wall, right, creating this atmosphere of fear, right, even though they may technically not be putting their hands on the other person, they, that person is still probably thinking, this person is so out of control right now, um, that this time they're punching a hole in the wall, but next time it could be me, right, so if you notice that a partner is, is um, being really aggressive with objects, you know, smashing phones, anything of that nature, that's actually a form of physical abuse. Um, if they are restraining um, a partner, maybe during an argument, not letting them leave the room, hiding their keys, et cetera, uh, that also could be a form of physical abuse. Even reckless driving. We know that for teens and young adults um, who are in an abusive relationship, the car is one of the most dangerous places to be with their abusive partner um, because we know that that partner, especially if they're in the driver's seat, um, they are going to either drive recklessly to scare their partner. Um, maybe they're going to make threats, you know, maybe saying, if you don't give me your passcode to your phone, I'm going to crash this car. Um, or maybe they will, you know, speed excessively or start driving erratically um, in order to um, scare their partner, right? Because in that moment, that person really doesn't have much of a choice. They either have to give in to their abusive partner partner 
or potentially, you know, jump out of a moving car or, um, you know, get out of the car in a place that may be unfamiliar or dangerous to them. So uh, it's important to recognize that even though their hands may be on the steering wheel the entire time, right, and not technically touching the other person's body, that still is a form of physical abuse because it is creating um, that, that threat of fear or injury for, for that partner. So that's physical abuse. Um, but now let's move on to the other types of abuse because there are many other forms of abuse and they can be just as harmful. So moving on to verbal abuse, that is using words to intentionally hurt someone. Um, and that could include mocking, belittling, name calling, misgendering someone, dead naming someone, um, cursing at them, put downs, right, being overly critical. Um, and closely linked with verbal abuse is emotional abuse. So emotional abuse is anything that someone says or does um, to break down another person's self-esteem or sense of self-worth. So if you're calling someone a name, if you're putting them down, if you're being overly critical, right, that is verbal abuse, but it also is a form of emotional abuse because that definitely is going to impact their self-esteem. So in addition to the verbal abuse, some other examples of emotional abuse includes that isolation that we mentioned previously, right? Being cut off from friends, family, social supports, um, blaming them for all the problems in the relationship and never taking responsibility for uh, their own actions, um, manipulation and sabotage, uh, that jealousy or possessiveness that we mentioned, that red flag before, um, gaslighting or playing head games. Uh, gaslighting is a fairly um, popular term now. And essentially it's going to be um, a pattern of intentionally um, lying or deceiving the other person to the point where they feel like they're going crazy. Um, so an example of gaslighting if I were to go up to my partner after an argument and I wanted to talk to my partner about it, um, if they were gaslighting me, they would either flat out deny um, that they did anything wrong and accuse me of, you know, not remembering things correctly or making things up in my mind, or they're going to be really dismissive and say, oh, I was just joking, relax, you're overreacting, you just want to create problems in the relationship, right? Um, and this happens over and over and over and over and over and over again um, until the point where I then internalize that dialogue. And now before I go to my partner to talk about something, I'm questioning myself and I'm asking myself, did I, you know, remember it the way that I think I, I'm remembering? Did I see it the way I think it's happening? Am I just overreacting? Am I being too sensitive? And that may not sound like a big deal because it's just like, okay, we all kind of have our own, you know, self-doubt from time to time. Um, but it is serious enough that they no longer trust their own um, eyes and ears and their own judgment, right? And now they're only deferring to their abusive partner um, and their narrative. And in that narrative, they're always wrong. It's always going to be their fault. It's, it's, they're always going to be the one to blame. So that's definitely going to impact someone's self-esteem. And even if the relationship ends and, you know, that person is able to move on, they still um, are going to have that, that emotional damage to deal with. And they're still um, are going to be questioning themselves and not able to trust themselves. And that can make them potentially, um, you know, potentially end up with another abusive partner, right? Because now they're vulnerable because they still don't trust themselves and they're deferring to other people to tell them what's what. So that is what gaslighting is. Um, again, it may not seem like it's a huge deal, but it is a, can significantly impact someone's life. So those are just a few examples of emotional abuse. Now, um, something that's lesser known, but it's actually extremely common. Um, in fact, one study showed that in 99% um, of abusive relationships, financial abuse was present. So financial abuse is preventing access to financial resources. Now, that can look like a number of different things. Um, it could be anything from giving the partner an allowance and making them account for every single penny that they spend. Um, it could be uh, you know, using their credit card um, or ruining their credit, refusing to pay bills. It could be sabotaging their work, maybe harassing them at work, calling them nonstop until they get fired. Um, and then that person is now dependent um, on the abusive partner financially. 
It could even be um, preventing them per, from pursuing higher education. And we see this a lot when we're looking at um, young adult relationships, right? Uh, this is a time where they're still trying to figure out what they wanna do in life. And if they have an abusive partner, they may try to convince them um, not to go to college, um, to skip class, to give up that sport um, that may get them a scholarship um, so that they can go to school, right? And again, it may not seem like a big deal in the moment, um, but we know that that not having that higher education um, severely limits their lifetime earning potential. Um, so even after the relationship is over, if they were in that critical moment, you know, in high school, that senior year of high school, if they had that abusive partner that discouraged them from going to school or, you know, sabotaged them in some type of way so that they could not um, pursue that degree, that's going to uh, inhibit them for years to come. So financial abuse, it's not often talked about, um, but it is very common and can impact someone's life um, for, you know, years after the relationship is over. And then we have digital abuse. Um, digital abuse is the use of technology or social media to intimidate, harass, bully, stalk, or threaten a partner. Um, so again, people may say, oh, what's a little bit of texting or cyberbullying here and there? Um, but we know that if someone is the victim of digital abuse, it increases their likelihood of them eventually being sexually abused and even physically abused. So we want to catch digital abuse early on, right, so that we can prevent other types of abuse taking place. So some examples of digital abuse include um, monitoring text messages, emails, or um, direct messages on social media, right, going through someone's phone and looking through who they're all their conversations and seeing who they're talking to. Again, that red flag of jealousy, right? If they're acting jealous, that leads to that abusive behavior of going through someone's phone, right? So that's why we talk about that spectrum. Um, if they're constantly texting them, right? If they don't pick up on the first call, they will spam their phone, send dozens and dozens of text messages or, you know, fill up their voicemail until they can't leave any more messages or call them nonstop until they pick up the phone, right? That's harassing behavior. If they're using social media and other apps to stalk um, that person. Maybe they are using the Find My iPhone feature um, and tracking them that way, or using Snap Map um, to see where they're going and who they're going to be with, um, or making humiliating posts or threatening to make humiliating posts, including revenge porn. And then last but not least, we have sexual abuse. And that is trying to pressure or force someone to do something sexually that they do not want to do. Um, so that could include um, rape, which is what we commonly think of as sexual abuse, but it also could include any type of unwanted physical touch. Um, it could be um, refusing to use protection or attempting to sabotage um, protection, right? Um, so hiding birth control pills or poking holes in condoms. Um, making the, the decision of whether someone wants to carry a baby or not, um, making a partner feel like they owe them, that they're obligated because they're in a relationship, that they have to give them sex. And if they don't, then they're going to go off and cheat on them, right? Or just asking over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until that person finally gives in, right? Again, that harassing behavior, um, they give in not because they want to do it, um, because they just want that uh, harassing behavior to stop. So those are all some examples of sexual abuse. And no matter um, if you're in a current, you know, dating relationship, sexual abuse can occur, whether you're married, whether you're dating partners, whether you're hooking up, um, just because you consented one time does not mean that you're consenting every time. Um, so it's important to recognize that sexual abuse absolutely occurs um, when we're talking about these dating relationships. All right, so those are the different, the six different types of abuse and notice that it expanded way beyond just physical abuse. Um, so now I just want to talk about the complexities of domestic violence um, and what might keep someone in an abusive relationship. So here are some reasons why someone might stay. Um, we talked about that fear before, uh, fear that, you know, if they leave, um, that, they'll, that the abuser will go after them and threaten to hurt 
you know, attack them or, or attack their, their loved ones, um, fear that they won't be able to survive on their own, fear that they'll never be able to find another partner. Um, maybe they're staying because of hope, especially if the abuser promised that it'll never happen again. Um, maybe they, they wanna believe them and they have hope that they can change or things are gonna be different. Maybe it's because of shame. Shame is a huge one. And we're gonna talk more about that when we talk about how we can help a friend. Um, but we know that domestic violence can happen irrespective of race, um, gender, age, religion, sexual orientation. It can happen to anyone. Um, but that still creates a lot of shame where someone's gonna say, you know, wh why did I let that happen to me? Or if someone is victim blaming and saying, why don't you just leave? Or why would you let someone treat you like that, right? That's gonna create a lot of shame um, and keep that person um, stuck in that abusive relationship. Maybe they're suffering from low self-esteem, especially if they've been experiencing, experiencing verbal and emotional abuse, um, their self-esteem is probably gonna be on the ground. And maybe they feel like that's all they deserve at this point or that um, they're never gonna be able to do better. So they stay for that reason. Maybe it's fear that they have no support, um, whether it be financially, emotionally, socially, right? Uh, there could be a number of reasons why they feel like they can't survive outside of that relationship. Maybe it's denial, especially if there's no physical abuse involved. A lot of times people will not recognize that the relationship is abusive unless there's some type of physical harm being done, right? But if someone is constantly um, harassing uh, another person um, via text message, if they're degrading them, um, if they are you know, sexually abusing them, that is abuse. Right? So we don't want to minimize that abuse. We want to call it out for what it is. Um, and it starts by talking about other kinds of abuse beyond just physical, right? To make sure that we know that there's that wide spectrum. Um, maybe it's because of friend or family pressure, uh, especially if they're, we're talking about maybe religion um, involved. Maybe there could be pressure um, if it's a married couple to stay together and not get divorced. Um, maybe, you know, to the outside world, you they look like the perfect couple and the perfect relationship and the perfect family, and they don't want to break that up. Um, so they stay to try to maintain that image, even though we know it's not the case. Maybe they blame them for the problems. And again, we talk, just talked about the victim blaming statements of why don't you just leave or why would you let someone treat you that way? After a while, they may believe that it's their fault, right? And that they're the, the cause of the abuse and, and that they are deserving of it. Um, so it's really important that as friends um, that we, we make sure that we are saying the opposite of that, right? And making sure we're letting them know that it's not their fault, um, that it's the abuser's fault, that they are actively choosing to um, exert that power and control and abuse them and those uh, number of ways that we just uh, covered. So make sure that we are dispelling that self-blame. Um, so before we move on, um, just wanted to wrap up by just talking a little bit more about the complexities. So um, before I mentioned that fear, it often takes a victim multiple times to leave a relationship before they terminate the relationship entirely. Um, it's estimated between five and eight attempts um, before a breakup sticks for good. Uh, so we know it's not an easy feat that there are a number of things that the victim has to consider. Um, and it may take multiple attempts for them to finally um, terminate that relationship. Um, some victims, may not want to leave the relationship. Um, in that previous slide, there was one more um, example that said love. Why might someone say? Because they love, they love their partner. Maybe it's not always bad, right? That there are gonna be good moments, right? So um, they may not want the relationship to end, they just want the abuse to end. Um, so it's important that we respect their decision um, and that we acknowledge that maybe they do wanna stay in the relationship. Uh, we know that leaving an abuser is the most dangerous time for a victim of domestic violence um, because that abuser recognized that they're getting ready to lose all control. So they may lash out and violently um, attempt to harm the victim or harm their family members or 
the abuser may even try to harm themselves or threaten to harm themselves as a form of, you know, coercive control and kind of manipulate them um, and guilt trip them to stay in that relationship. So it's so, so, so important that if someone is attempting to leave an abusive relationship that they do get plugged into services um, at agencies such as the Domestic Violence Crisis Center so that we can safety plan with them um, and help them exit that relationship um, safely. Um, and most importantly, we know that victims know the risk and rewards of staying or leaving, right? They're the expert in their own lives and they, they know what makes their abusive partner tick better than we could ever know. Even, you know, as experts in the field, we don't know that relationship, right? We don't know that an individual. So it's important that we let them take the lead um, and they kind of let us know how we can help. Right, because again, when we're talking about abusive relationships, we talk about that imbalance of power and control. And the best way that we can help that victim, um, you know, regain their power and control is by making, allowing them to make their own decisions and not further trying to tell them what they can or can't do. Okay. Um, so before we wrap up with how to help a friend, I just wanted to show a short video um, just to kind of explain how there are other ways, again, that people can be abused, and it may not be as obvious as physical abuse, but it absolutely is a form of abuse. Should, should I play it? We're going to play it. Okay. I'll call you tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna be home a little late tonight. Okay. Uh, how late? Uh, twelve, maybe one. Twelve. Okay. Uh, all right. I guess just call me. Get on. Okay. Someone's trying to get a hold of you. Yeah. Hey, Ali. Oh, hey, Sam. What are you doing? Just eating your chips. I tried calling you. Oh, I'm sorry. I just got your text. Where was your phone? It was in my back. Can you hear it? Well, I just got the text when I walked in. It can't be that hard to pick up your phone, Ali. I did. I did thought you could I told you. I told you I was going to be out with Katie. Was it just Katie? You're just having too much of a good time with Katie? I'm worried about where you are, and all you reply back is, I'm busy. I, I should have picked it up. I'm it's just, your I'm phone. Sorry. You always have your phone. You know what I mean? Yeah? No, I didn't hear it. I should not hear your phone. I already answered that question. You know how easy it is to pick up? That's the problem. It doesn't make sense, Ali. It doesn't make sense. I'm so sorry. 
I don't know how that video made uh, you feel, but it definitely um, made me feel really anxious. I also felt really frustrated. Um, there were a number of different types of abuse. I don't know if you were able to spot all of them. Um, there are definitely elements of digital abuse. You know, the main argument that happened over and over and over again was um, her not picking up her phone. Um, there were some elements of physical abuse. I don't know if you caught that when uh, the partner threw the dish and you could see her reaction. She was very afraid and she tried to exit um, that room. Um, when he started punching the steering wheel, again, that frightened her and she was afraid for her um, safety and she tried to exit the vehicle. Um, there was tons of emotional uh, abuse, uh, that constant badgering, uh, the gaslighting. Um, so it really is a great example where you did not see that partner once lift their hand and hit them strike them in any type of way, but that absolutely was a form of an abusive relationship, right? So we want to make sure that we are acknowledging those types of examples um, and helping our friends to recognize the, those types of red flags and abusive behaviors um, so that they don't feel like it's their fault um, or they don't try to minimize or deny um, that that it is that bad, right? Because it, it that was a that was a very unhealthy uh, abusive relationship. So just wanna wrap up um, and talk about how to help a friend. So this year's theme um, for Domestic Violence Awareness Month is everyone knows someone. So um, we all know someone in our life, whether we know it or not, uh, that is most likely in an abusive relationship. Think back to the beginning um, of the presentation when we said one in four women and one in seven men. So we know someone. So here are some ways that we can start the conversation. Um, we can focus on their rights in the relationship. Um, think back to those green flags. Tell them, you know, you know that they're deserving of respect and they're deserving of someone that's going to trust them and be open and honest with them and be able to communicate with them in a healthy way, right? So remind them of their rights and what they deserve in the relationship those green flags. Then we also wanna talk about the red flags. We wanna discuss those warning signs that we talked about before, the being really possessive, being really clingy or minimizing, being dismissive, um, accusing them of things. It's really important though, that when we are discussing red flags that we're calling out the behavior and not calling out the partner. Because if we go up to our friend and say, oh, this person is such a jerk, they're so mean, you know, they're so abusive, it's most likely just gonna cause that person to want to um, defend their partner. And they might say, oh, you just caught them on a bad day um, or you just have to get to know them a little bit better. Um, or they may even blame themselves and say, oh, that was me. I, I triggered them, I set them off. So instead of you know attacking the partner, just call out those behaviors. Talk about those red flags that you're seeing. Say, you know, I noticed that they're texting you a lot even though they know that you're out with friends. How does that make you feel? Do you feel overwhelmed when they do that? Doesn't really seem like they're respecting your independence right now, right? So call out the behavior without calling out the partner. Most importantly, you just wanna spend time with them. Let them know that you are available to talk whenever, um, wherever, right? Just know that they have that support system because we talked about that isolation previously, one of those red flags um, where they feel like they have no one that they can reach out to, no one that they can confide in, right? And maybe every conversation doesn't have to be about the relationship. You know, if they're constantly dealing with that type of abuse, sometimes they just want a relief. They just want to talk about their favorite TV show or talk about work or talk about something else. So whatever they need, just spend that time with them, um, be that, that non-judgmental source of support. 
Um, so again, here are some examples of what that might sound like, right? You deserve to be respected and to have your thoughts and opinions valued. Um, or if you're gonna point out the red flag, you can say, you know, I've noticed that they always text you and wanna know where you are. How does that make you feel? Do you feel like you have your own space and time? That's a great way to start the conversation um, without, you know, just attacking them and saying, I think you're in an abusive relationship because that's probably just gonna shut down the conversation, right? But ask them how they feel. Um, some additional things that you can do, especially if we're talking about that emotional abuse that we said, uh, we mentioned a number of times today. Um, if they feel like they don't have any outer resources, you can discuss their support systems and provide them referrals, such as to DVCC. Um, or if they are suffering from low self-esteem because their partner is constantly berating them or blaming them um, for the problems in the relationship, you want to make sure that you're believing what they're saying and validating them um, and letting them know it's not their fault and also discussing their strengths, talk about how strong they are, how brave they are for, for being able to, you know, trust someone enough to talk to them about this really personal stuff, right? So you really kind of want to st start to rebuild their self-esteem. Um, if they are feeling guilty um, due to the emotional abuse, again, you want to discuss all the dynamics that we just mentioned today um, about abusive relationships and remind them that it's not their fault. No matter what their partner is saying, no matter how much their partner may be gaslighting them, it is not their fault, right? It's their partner that is choosing to act in that way. Um, additionally, if they are facing physical abuse, um, we talked about how dangerous it is dangerous it is when they are ready to leave the relationship. So you want to make sure that you are connecting them um, to a service like domestic violence crisis center so that they can safety plan um, and give them the resources that they need so that they can make an informed decision on how they want to proceed. Now, this one is a little bit of a tricky one because not only will we know someone that's in an abusive relationship, we may know the abuser. Um, and it's important that we don't just turn a blind eye. A part of helping a friend is also helping someone if we believe that they are the abuser in the relationship, right? As friends, we don't wanna have this blind loyalty where we can never think our friend or our loved one is doing something wrong. We have a responsibility to, um, to still speak on it. So if it is safe to do so, you want to talk to your friend, your loved one out of a place of concern um, and not out of shame or embarrassment. Um, if we are, we can't shame someone into changing or embarrassing them, it's going to come out of a place of love. You know, you can say, I'm concerned about you, right? This doesn't seem like you. Is there anything going on? Do you want to talk about it? Right? Can I... Um, you know, take you somewhere? Uh, do, how can I help you? Because I'm really worried because it does not seem like you're happy or um, you feel good in this relationship either, right? It feels very, very unhealthy. Instead of attacking them and just saying that they're, you know, an awful person, because that's less likely um, going to, you know, get them to to want to change. I want to appeal to their best self and remind them that they're not a bad person, but the behavior that they're displaying towards their partner is not okay. Now, this one can be really, really, really tricky, um, but it's Im important just to recognize that the world is not black and white. There are tons of great uh, shades of gray. So while someone may be a fantastic friend, um, they could be a really stinky romantic partner. Um, and, you know, those two things can be true at the same time. So, you know, we want to separate those actions from the person because actions can change, right? So we want to acknowledge that, that um, unhealthy behavior, right? And again, encourage them to get the help that they need, um, rather than trying to shame them into changing. So if it's safe to do so, you want to talk to your friend or loved one um, using those tips. However, if it's unsafe, if you feel like if I start this conversation, it's just going to cause them to, um, you know, blame their, their partner or it may create a, an unsafe environment for them, um, you, if you can do it, you want to try to uh, talk to the, their partner alone, um, you know, just let them know that you are there. Um, offer them your phone, your computer, especially if they feel like they're the victim of digital abuse and um, all their devices are being monitored. Um, you can most importantly, just believe them. If they come to you and they trust you enough to share this information, 
it's so important that you just validate them and let them know that you believe them and that you're not going to tell, um, you know, the, the abusive partner, your friend or your loved one, right, that you are there to support them as well. Um, so those are some things that you can do if you feel like it's not safe, um, but you know that your, your friend is the abusive person in the relationship. Um, so that is all. Um, we thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, we have some additional events going on. Um, if you want to scan our QR code, you can download a free resource guide that has a summary of this presentation, as well as that last uh, tip sheet on how to help a friend um, if you suspect that they're in an unhealthy or abusive relationship. So you can either scan the QR code or you can visit our website, DV ccct.org. Thank you.